Now, if you believe in God, can you really believe in science? The Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs believes you can and that we need both science and religion to answer the big questions. This week, a BBC documentary pitches him head to head with the man best known for leading the scientific attack on religion, Professor Richard Dawkins. I think religion hinders science because religion is content to lie down and accept supernatural explanations, whereas science sees a challenge whenever we don't understand something, the challenge is to try to understand it. Science gives us enormous power. Religion gives us an enormous heritage of human wisdom as to how best to use that power. And the conversation between them is a conversation that may involve each of us moving outside our comfort zone, but it's a conversation that is a signal of hope. Both scientists and theologians are interested in the big questions, and rightly so, and that's where we agree. Um, religion answers on the basis of faith, science answers on the basis of evidence, and that's by far the biggest difference. There are plenty of good scientists and indeed great scientists who believed in God and who still believe in God. Einstein had an almost mystical belief in God, creator of the universe, although he did not believe in the God of the prophets who speaks to human beings. Um, but his religious belief uh, was profound and almost mystical. You can point to individual scientists and individual good scientists who do have a belief in God. Um, but we do know that the human mind is capable of dividing itself into separate parts and of holding incompatible beliefs. And so the mere fact that you can find individual scientists, even good ones, who are religious, doesn't mean that there's any kind of great compatibility between science and religion. I think religion is our greatest set of answers to the three fundamental questions that any reflective human being must ask. Who am I? Why am I here? How then shall I live? Those questions cannot be answered by science. So do science and religion play complementary roles in society? Or are they in competition? If you truly believe in science, can you really believe in God? And you can see that documentary, Rosh Hashanah, Science versus Religion, presented by Lord Sachs this Wednesday on BBC One at 11.15pm. Now, if you have a webcam, you can make your point on Skype or you can join in the conversation on Twitter, phone, text or email. The details are all on the screen. And joining us is Steve Fuller, who's an American philosopher and sociologist who believes in God and has written about the theory of intelligent design. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start with you, Andrew, uh, really. Can a good scientist really believe in God? Well, I think that that's, I mean, I think that's a, a question that you can answer just by looking around and saying, yes, obviously, there are people who are good scientists who also um, believe in God and are religious. And I think the, in the video you've just shown, Richard Dawkins made a good point about that, which is to say people can believe, you know, different things at different times. Human beings are complicated. Um, you know, you can believe on the one hand that there is a God and on the other hand be a totally competent, maybe even brilliant um, physicist or biologist or chemist or whatever. I think the interesting question is, um, are there, is it legitimate, are the people who claim that religion can answer the same questions that science can answer, is that a legitimate claim for them to make? And I think no. I think if you, if you are a religious person who believes that your religion will answer questions like where did uh, human beings come from, um, what is you know, the behaviour of, of matter in this world, what is true about the physical universe and so on, and there are some religious people who think that. I think the religious people who think that are wrong and that the only way of answering those questions, you know, what is this uh, world all around us, how do these things behave, even historical questions like what is it that happened in the past, um, you know, what is the truth of this or that story in the past, you have to answer those questions with evidence and with hypotheses and with a scientific method. Uh, Steve, this is the big concern that uh, Dawkins is saying we need evidence and there's a growing movement of creationists and indeed people talking about intelligent design which he argues is not real evidence and it's, it's in danger of damaging um, scientific thinking and, and rational thought? 
Well, I think that in a sense uh, the history of this is completely wrong, that in a sense we wouldn't have modern science as we do today if it weren't for certain kinds of religious attitudes that took hold in the 17th century. But if you bring it forward, it's not enough to say, well, that's how it was then. If you bring it forward well, to now, is there not a threat from creationist thinking I don't challenging see it, I science? See, I actually don't see it as a threat. I think the bigger threat is whether we believe in science at all, especially in this large-scale sense of being able to come up with a unified theory of everything. I happen to believe in that, and this is the sort of thing physicists still go after. But the whole meaningfulness of that kind of project is predicated on the idea that we actually can get a rational grasp of the entire universe. Now, why do we even have that kind of idea? That idea goes back to the, to the biblical idea that we have been created in the image and likeness of God. Because that's really the only clear precedent for the idea that human beings are so special with regard to the possibilities for understanding how the world works. Um, Francesca, you're an atheist. Um, what's your view of the kind of Richard Dawkins position? Firstly, I think Richard Dawkins does a real disservice to atheists. Um, though I'm an atheist myself, Why? I think he represents a point of view that deliberately caricatures and vilifies certain religious beliefs. Um, I don't hold to those beliefs myself, but I think he completely misunderstands what religion is trying to do, and particularly what these biblical ideas are trying to express about the world. So, not a big fan of his. Um, but you think what he deliberately confuses what is metaphor and is no, not... No, I just don't think he understands understood. it. I honestly don't think he literature. understands biblical literature at all. I think, um, you know, he's a scientist. He's not been trained to read these texts in their historical, social, cultural context. And but th but there I is think some, that shows. I, 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 to yeah. back this up, I think it is... There was a... T if you go back to the 17th century, the people who were the founders of modern science actually did read the biblical text. So the point was, these two things have not always been so separated and so incompatible as they seem now if you listen to somebody like Richard Dawkins. Um, and so in a sense that, you know, one needs to go to, let's say, the late 19th century where you start to see this kind of schism taking place okay. that we see now. Yeah. Andrew, yeah, if you go back in time to, to, to a point at which society was drenched with Christian ideas and when also Christian ideas are very political as well, so you had to really say you were a Christian, even if you weren't really, to participate in intellectual and public life, then of course you'll find a mixing together of these things. It's true that Isaac Newton, you know, um, believed in God, but he also believed in alchemy. That doesn't mean that alchemy is now also really legitimate and we should be looking at that. Um, to, to inform our, our scientific thinking. I think thinking. that's a really important point, is that people now, pe people like Dawkins present science as somehow factual, this is the truth, yes, this is evidence. to be evidence. fair to Dawkins, he right. doesn't say it has all the answers, he just says its job is, is to find, to ask questions, and where it doesn't have answers, he's worried about faith, he thinks, you know, making up stuff yeah. to fill in as the gaps. Absolutely, right. yes, but I think he risks being as dogmatic as some okay. more conservative yes. Christians are. He's oh. imposing one ideology and, uh, and in I place of another. The image of, the, the image of religion is being short-sold here in terms of its cognitive aspirations. Right. I want to bring in a contributor here. Uh, joining us is Professor Steve Jones, who's, uh, I think, Emeritus Professor of Genetics at University College London. Um, I know that... Um, Steve Jones, I know that you've written in the past about your concern about a minority of students who were walking out of biology classes because it clashed with their views on creationism. Can you tell me what you think is your view about the relationship in the modern world between some religious thinking and science? Is there any danger in, in religious thinking? Yes, I think there's an enormous amount of danger in, in religious thinking. Um, you know, I live in the 21st century, not the 16th century or the 1st century, as many of your contributors seem to. And if you look at the interaction between science and uh, religion now, there's a very useful word which is called the endarkenment, which is the opposite of the enlightenment. We now have a new inspissated ignorance which is being fed to young people by people who are probably by pastors imams and the like who probably don't believe what they're saying really but they feel they have to say it my my concern really is what happens to you let's say you're at the age of six or eight or what have you and your religious leader tells you that the earth began 4004 bc in a magical way and you believe him of course you would then you get to be 16 and you're doing biology at university and you discover he wasn't telling the truth why should he be telling the truth about anything else um, do you want to take that steve I, I think Steve Jones is mischaracterizing what's happening now. I think, as a matter of fact, what's taking place is that people are getting uh knowledge about science through many different sources more than ever before um, and there's a, you know through the internet through popularizations through television programs like this and other related things and I think people are beginning to form their own views and I think in that in that context religious organizations have played a very important role but I would say that this is not anti-science at all that's happening I think it's it's sort of science is undergoing its own Protestant reformation where there's a decentralization of scientific authority so that people like Steve Jones represent sort of you know the Pope's 
and archbishops, as it were, right. of the old Catholic Church, only with regard to science, but now we're getting a more democratized science environment to which religion is contributing. Steve Jones, a more democratized environment to science, do you accept that? Um, science isn't a democracy. That's the one thing it's not. Um, you, if you're a democracy, you often hear this in the media. A top scientist is uh, interviewed, a mathematician who's discovered the two and two is four. Then we have somebody else who thinks from the duodecimal liberation front that two and two is five, and we end up with a compromise that is between four and five, probably nearer to four. Science doesn't work like that. It moves onwards. We accept things. If they're wrong, we, we, we throw them out. But we do not work by the majority. In the United States, more than half the population believes that the Earth began 4,000 years ago. That's not true, full stop. Steve Jones, thank you. I want to bring in another uh, scientist who's the uh, Reverend Professor David Wilkinson, uh, who's now an ordained Methodist minister. Uh, we've heard this discussion about you know, you've heard Steve Jones there explaining his real concern about how religion is, is messing the way that science is regarded. Um, what's your view? My view is that um, sometimes religion can suppress science, but in my own experience as an astrophysicist and as a Christian believer, the two have liberated each other. That is, that I become more excited about science and more excited about Christian faith as I go on. And that's because I believe that evidence uh, is involved in both science and Christian faith. And you have to look at it, uh, although they look at the universe in different ways, they share a, an interest in evidence. So for instance, I was drawn to the Christian faith at the age of 17, as it happens, because of its emphasis upon evidence, religious experience in lots of different people, the fact that the universe itself poses questions which science itself can't answer, such as where do the beauty and intelligibility of the physical laws come from, and most importantly for me, the evidence of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. The claim There's no evidence for that. There's no evidence for that. Professor Wilkinson, I want Andrew to come in. Go on, what did you just say? There's no evidence for that. I mean, Francesca will know more about this than I do as, as a scholar of the Bible, but of course there's substantial evidence that most of, of the Bible, well, there's, there's a lack of evidence that most of the Bible is true. Mm. I think this is actually just the sort of self-deception that is a worry when science and religion do commingle, is that, I mean, I can't see, for example, why historical claims, claims about things claims about things that happen in the Bible, for example, shouldn't be subject to exactly the same tests of evidence um, as anything else. That's the scientific method at work in every area of our life. Yes. And I feel that some... Just, you know, let, just let him finish, Professor Wilkinson, I'll bring it back Sometimes people who say things like that um, are, are the victims of self-deception. I mean, as I say, Francesca is the biblical scholar, so she'll have more but to say But do you think Professor Wilkinson's a victim of self-deception? It sounded like, like that from what he was saying then. I think so. And Francesca's nodding, which means uh, gives me <laughs> support. <laughs> scientific for that. Backing. Professor Wilkinson, and what's the evidence your for response? Yeah, I think the theory. historical evidence does need to be sifted. I'm not uh, arguing against that, and I really take exception to being called self-deceived yeah. on this. I teach theology. I'm part of a, a university at Durham which takes theology and historical evidence within the Bible extremely seriously and takes the academic component of that extremely seriously. But you do seriously. teach theology, which is about religious belief, whereas I teach biblical studies, which is about the examination of ancient literature. So I do think we're approaching the evidence, as it were, from, from quite different perspectives. There's no evidence for a resurrection. Professor Wilkinson, we'll have to leave it there for the moment, but thank you. I wanted to ask the one thing implicit in Professor Wilkinson's comments is the idea that religion gives a moral compass. And on issues like, say, fertility treatment, scientists can do all kinds of things, mm. but we have panels with religious people on them to draw an ethical framework. Um, no, don't we need no. religion to do that? Absolutely, no. absolutely not. I mean, sometimes, uh, sometimes I think that um, religious organisations and representatives on those panels can have a deeply immoral effect by importing their own beliefs that come from scriptures and affecting the moral lives of people well, today. I, why, for example, why, for example, with 80% of people in this country supporting assisted dying for the term Lille, to take an example, why is it that ethicists, you know, in the media, ethicists who are often, often religious, again and again, say no, people shouldn't be allowed to have assisted dying. Look, it's not because they care about individuals' choices, it's not because they're moral, it's because some scripture tells them that this is a I thing th to I do. I think that's there's a slide, that's, a slide is potentially going on here, but b between saying whether a religious uh, authority should have some kind of say in the matter, which I think the answer is yes, mm -hmm. versus whether one should just automatically believe what they say, which is an, a more contested issue. But I do think one of the values that religion does pose in these kind of tricky moral issues 
is a clear sense of what a human being is and what a human being is for and how it's placed in the universe. Well, I think that's incredibly damaging because most of the main religions share well, the basic values. you're going to have to take a view on it somehow. Francisca, uh, but 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 most, but most of the main point. religions share a sense of what basic human decency and, and being communal with each other is. You don't, well, most of them share the same ideas only, about uh, the value uh, of life. You don't need a particular religious tradition to tell you no, whether it's you right do, or wrong you, to have an abortion But the religions tend to be quite or, clear about on things where secular people are quite fuzzy and are quite e you know, quite easily have a very laissez-faire well, attitude. Flip it round, though. I'm taking the American example where President Bush put a restriction on stem cell research for his religious reasons. Can't it work the other way? That religion closes down things that most society agrees we should be doing. Like I say, one has to take these claims on their face. In other words, I don't say we should just be bowing down to particular religious views. I think part of the issue here is whether religion should have any say in the discussion. Because I took what Andrew was saying was basically to try to rule religion no. out from actually having no. a say. No, absolutely ahead, not. Absolutely. Absolutely not, absolutely not. Two things. First of all, I don't think that clarity is always the best thing. Sometimes we have to accept that, um, you know, uh, moral questions are very complicated. True, religious traditions may have, you know, commendably clear and strict um, rules and very clear views, but clarity is not always what we want. We want sometimes, you know, some acceptance that there's, you know, grays in an argument. Sorry, but I don't want to keep religious people out of the discussion, out of the argument at all. I just want to prevent the ethical views of one particular group preventing the ethical decisions of another group. They don't have the majority. majority. Well, this is about more democracy. Authority. I want to bring in one other contributor, if I can. Alam Shaha is the author of The Young Atheist's Handbook. He's a physics teacher and was brought up um, as a strict yes. Muslim, but is now, as we can tell from the book title, an atheist and a scientist. What's your view in brief on where we are? Do you think there is a danger posed to society by, by the power of religion? Is it, is it damaging science teaching? Uh, I've been really uh, kind of upset at the fact that none of the scientists have put forward in any evidence really that religion is damaging science. I teach many religious students who go on to university to study science and I think they're perfectly capable of holding those two ways of looking at the world simultaneously because people do that. You know, we all have cognitive dissonance. There is an issue of intellectual compatibility in terms of the different ideas that children grow up with, but we do a great disservice to children by thinking that they can't cope with that, that they can't actually learn how to arrive at their own ways of looking at the world. And ultimately, that's what it boils down to. You're not concerned about the power of children. I mean, you've talked about being brought up in a strict way, the fear of hell, taboos about what you can eat. Does that not worry you that religion is affecting children that way? Is that right in a modern look, world? Look, I, I, I grew up to be an atheist. I'm, I'm evidence of the fact that a good education can give you the freedom to think for yourself. Excellent, excellent. Alan, That's thank what it you. Should do. Um, I mean, do you think that, that, that the debate is getting a bit harder between religion and um, Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I don't believe in religion, but I don't necessarily believe in science. I see and science now is the very modern Western world's answer to, you know, lots of different questions that people have been wrestling with for years. So what do you but believe in? <laughs> you know what? Sorry. <laughs> we really can't, can you can answer anything you don't believe, I believe in? Believe in the goodness of people. You don't right. need okay. religious authorities but to tell you the way the world is. That. Well, it's not a bad place to start, is it? It's Thank very you very much. Thank you so much. A couple of your contributions on this, uh, Tom. Faith is what you rely on when you don't care about the evidence. That's why religion teaches us nothing, and science does. Rob, religion deals with how people hope or fear things are. Science looks at the reality, and an anonymous one, science without religion is blind, and religion without science is lame. I think someone very famous said that. Kant. Yeah. It's a paraphrase of Kant. Yeah, of oh, Kant, there you go. Mm. I don't think it was right. Kant who was emailing <laughs> in there with that one. <laughs> anyway, later on Sunday Morning Live. As four Christians appeal to the European Court of Human Rights about what they see as an attack on their religious freedoms, we ask, are Christians being persecuted in Britain? You can join in by webcam or make your views known by phone, email or online. And remember, keep voting too in our poll. The question, should we be allowed to use any force to protect our homes? If you think you should, then text the word VOTE followed by YES. If you think you shouldn't, then text VOTE followed by NO. Our text number is 81771 and texts will be charged at your standard message rate. You've got about five minutes before the poll closes or you can vote online by visiting our website. It's time for our moral moment. And this week we're giving our panellists a sneak preview of analysis of faith in Britain commissioned for the BBC Religion and Ethics Festival, Rethink, which is taking place in Salford this Wednesday and Thursday. And I'll be sharing some of the discussion if you're coming. The research has thrown up some interesting facts about young people and religion in British society. Two thirds of 16 to 25 year olds claim they don't belong to any religion. And young white British citizens are the ethnic group least likely to belong to a religion. Um, 
Andrew, you've had a chance to look at some of the stats you all have. I mean, what are your thoughts about what this says about the status and the importance of religion in Britain today? I think what's most interesting about it, I mean, it's an analysis of existing data. So we already knew a lot of the facts that are, that, that are in there. We knew, for example, that young people are really unlikely to be a member of, of any religion. What's interesting is the analysis that now sort of maps that trend over time. So we can see that it's not just that when they grow up there you know, and get older, they are likely to believe in religion. It's not the case that young people don't believe in religion and old people are more likely to. It's actually a generational effect. So the decline of religious identification, and not in this uh, survey, but in other surveys, there's also been similar data for belief um, and practice as well as identity. The decline is long term and looks pretty terminal. It overall. is interesting, Stephen. I also want, as an, uh, you know, someone with an American background, and in America, you know, there is much more religious observance. What do you make of the fact that it does seem to be declined? And a big generational difference. Younger people much less likely to have a religious affiliation. Well, uh, the first thing I would, the first point I would make about uh, surveys of this kind is that they are really looking for membership in well-organized churches and religious groups. Uh, in a sense, this survey doesn't really address the more general issue whether people believe in God or have some kind of spirituality. I think there's more data that will be released next yeah, week. Yeah, and, 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 and so in a sense, I think we, we need, this is, a, this is a question about the institutionalization of, of belief, and I'm not surprised by the figures myself. Um, I think there's a sense in which religion uh, in, in this kind of survey is primarily providing a kind of sense of cultural identity. Um, and if cultural identity can be gotten somewhere other than, in, than the faith, let's say through other aspects of secular society, uh, then I think that that is uh, where the identification will come and there won't be a need for religion. Now the United States, you asked me about yeah. the United States, and it seems to me there, of course, there is still very strong uh, religious cultural identification. If you look at the two uh, nominating conventions for both political parties that have taken place in the past couple of weeks. Both of them invoked God in very serious ways and have been trying to mobilize various religious groups and so forth. Now the interesting thing of course about the United States in this context is that it has official separation of church and state. But one of the consequences of that has been to allow for a kind of flourishing of lots of different religious groups which then as it were, okay. occupy a lot of the cultural and political space. I just want to bring it back to obviously the surveys about Britain. I mean, what's your view? You're quite interested in what it says about the status of the Church of England, weren't you, compared to other groups? Yeah, one of the some of the stats were quite interesting and suggested that, um, to me, it sort of reflected the idea that if younger generations don't seem to affiliate themselves with right British religion, which historically is Church of England, I mean, I think it reflects the fact that the Church of England is pretty much this kind of decaf diet coke kind of Christianity Dilute. now it's a bit wishy-washy there's nothing appealing about it so well, I think younger people I mean that's interesting with that and, and briefly I noticed that with the ethnicity breakdowns 97 percent of young Bangladeshis under 25 and 95 percent of young Pakistanis said they had a strong religious mm. identity Indians um, mm. too so is I mean is that an interesting statistic about ethnicity is that as Steve was saying about cultural identity more or is that religious observance I think perhaps it reflects more sort of social context I mean we're a very urban society now in Britain and I think multiculturalism in these you know major cities I think perhaps it there's a different kind of identity that young white British people are, are, are taking from their, you know, from their culture and their society than perhaps different sorts of ethnic groups who, for whom perhaps you know, second or third generation families have more we of a sense of identity. Sadly, we have to leave it there, but I know there'll be more research on this out on Wednesday. Thank you all very much.